This is week 11 of our 30 weeks together, week 11, and therefore we are in that moment of Western history when uh, Christianity is spreading and uh, the Roman world is dealing with it. And by the year 400, a generation of extraordinary people uh, help create a definitive synthesis that will be the basis of all of the rest of Western civilization. So uh, this is one of the most important nights that we spend together, one of the most important subjects that we take up. Uh, the most difficult to understand, the most complicated, the most long enduring, and it's fair to suggest that the people who are part of this synthetic generation, this generation at around 400, uh, are extraordinary creative figures uh, without equal. And three especially stand out. Augustine here on the screen that you're seeing, and his friend uh, Ambrose in Milan, and their friend Jerome in Jerusalem, who was working uh, at that very moment around 400 on the Latin translation of the Bible, the first complete Latin translation of both Old and New Testament. And that Bible would be the Bible that everyone would use for um, a thousand years. So that, that Bible is the basis of all Western civilization scholarship and thinking about biblical issues for a thousand years. So, so tonight we want to talk about that moment. We want to talk about that uh, synthetic extraordinary moment. And the most important person uh, at that moment is Augustine. You see him uh, here, St. Augustine. This is a portrait of him by Botticelli. Uh, in the wonderful church of Onisanti in Florence. Of course, Botticelli didn't know what Augustine looked like, so what he did was give his imaginative touch to it. But I think it's nice. I like it. Don't you like it? Isn't it nice to have the little study and his books and his little um, astrolabe and all his other little scientific uh, instruments, which are correct because this is a generation that's fascinated with all the aspects of Greek science. The most important book about St. Augustine is this book. Uh, Peter Brown is one of the great scholars of the 20th century, uh, and his biography of Augustine, on which he has worked and added and added revisions to it many different times, and now in print in a beautiful quality paperback. There's a picture of it on the screen. I'm holding it here in front of me. Very, very rich, very thick, very fine, very great book, very great study. And um, if you want to know more about Augustine, that would be the book that you'd want. Some of you will be raised in the British world, and so you'll be saying Augustine. So we will allow both pronunciations here. You can be Augustine, or you can be Augustine. You can be Augustinian. Uh, the Augustinian, uh, that's a wonderful order that uh, Luther is part of. So when we talk about Martin Luther, we'll be talking about a member of the Augustinian order. So you may pronounce it any way you want. I first learned it because when I was at UCLA as an undergraduate, the first time I'd ever heard anybody say anything about this person was a pretty little church in Santa Monica. Well, it was named St. Augustine. So that's how I learned how to say it. So mine is a, a Monican pronunciation. <laughs> And if you know anything about Augustine, then you know who his mama was. Monica, exactly, Santa Monica. She was not from California. She was from a distant land, but she did give her name to one of the California great coastal cities, Santa Monica. So, yeah, Santa Monica is Augustine's mother. We also, of course, want to talk about uh, the place he came from, since if you read a biography or a book about him someplace, it will say Augustine of Hippo, Augustine of Hippo, since he was the Bishop of Hippo, and you see right there on your map, Hippo is along the North African coast. It was in a part of the world that was very ancient in terms of civilization because, of course, this had been the great Carthaginian state 
all the way back to the days of Dido. So, so this is a very settled, very much a part of the Mediterranean world. And um, then, of course, in the confrontation between Rome and Carthage, Rome won. So then this North African strip was converted into a part of the Roman Empire. And there were many cities along this coast that were quite rich and cultured by virtue of trade, which, of course, moved along the North African shore from Egypt west uh, to all the way to Spain. And then, of course, in Spain, there was a very important Roman presence. So, so Hippo was uh, a fairly significant city, and that is where uh, Augustine spent his career uh, once he became the Bishop of Hippo. You see his dates, 354 to 430, so 76. That was a pretty good long life in the 5th uh, century, so that meant that he had time to write a lot of books. Uh, and, of course, the most important book of all is his masterpiece, which in print would certainly be as big as Peter Brown's uh, biography of him, uh, called The City of God. And we aren't going to talk about it or open it up or discuss it, but just so you know, if you're uh, lounging in a bookstore and want to learn more about Augustine, uh, uh, City of God is his masterpiece after the year 410, when the sack of Rome is so shocking to everyone uh, in the world, shocking, that he sits down and writes a book about it. So that's the city of God. And it's his attempt to make sense of history and Christianity and the Roman Empire. And so that's, and, and it's probably the most important thing he wrote because then it's there for a thousand years during all the Middle Ages when people look back on the fall of Rome and wondered what it all meant. And, and there was, was his book. So that's our, that's our main star. We could say our star tonight is uh, Augustine of Hippo, St. Augustine. But before we turn to him, what we want to talk about is that interesting couple of hundred years between the life of Jesus and the beginnings of the lives of these people, Ambrose, Augustine, and Jerome. That period is very important to Christianity because, of course, they go from being a tiny little group in Israel of hundreds to then an international presence in the Mediterranean and then to a larger presence in the capital and then to the presence of people knowing who they are and being persecuted and being identified and having names and, and having books uh, written about them. So that's that's the the journey that we want to make here. So we're back in the Mediterranean, and we're thinking about this progress from zero, year zero, we could say here tonight, to um, the, the story of, um, of Israel and Jesus and his followers. And we know that his story begins in 5 BC, begins in this little town of Bethlehem, because his parents were called there for a census. Incidentally, one of the things people have written is that Luke's mention of a census is not historically accurate. It isn't true. We have all kinds of information now about a variety of types of censuses that were done in uh, the reign of Augustus. So it begins here in Bethlehem, 5 BC, and we know that it's 5 BC because all the documents said that Jesus is born in the time of Herod the Great, and Herod the Great died in 4 BC. So it means that Jesus had to be born in uh, 5 BC, and here is what it's all about. Here's the story, 5 BC, the little manger, and don't you love that little Catalonian nativity? This is in Barcelona. Isn't that the cutest little donkey you've ever seen? Huh? That little neon donkey, don't you love him? Don't you love the neon donkey? This is really a wonderful artist in, in Barcelona around the year 1000 with a little green stra uh, swaddling clothes wrap up of of Jesus. Uh, it's called the Avia Altar. And so that's the beginning. That's in Bethlehem. And then the life is lived, the life of Jesus from 5 BC to 30 AD, so 30, 35 years, is lived around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, here's a picture of the Sea of Galilee and the map, which you've seen before. Uh, you can see at the top there of Judea is Galilee, way up at the north. And that's where Jesus lives his life, most of his life, preaching his adult life, preaching traveling to these various cities. And then, of course, the, the end of the life is in Jerusalem. Uh, and then, of course, people begin to tell that story. Here are uh, two 
pictures. One is Rembrandt's portrait of Jesus. It's a very famous version. Um, and then right next to it, you see the face on the Shroud of Turin. As you know, no one had any idea what the Shroud of Turin imprint looked like until photography came along. And, and that's like the 1890s. And then the photographer who was allowed to take a photograph reversed it did a negative, and once he looked at it, he realized that the imprint on the shroud is a negative, and so if you reverse it with photography, you can see the imprint. So that uh, vision of Jesus, that vision of the face, is just, it's just interesting to see what a agreement there is in different sources. Way, way back, the very earliest uh, uh, images of Jesus, uh, there's uh, a general agreement on what he looked like. Here are the other two figures who are most important in this story, um, Augustus. Now, Augustus was the emperor when, he, uh, when Jesus was born. Augustus becomes the supreme ruler of Rome in 27 BC, and he lives uh, until 14 AD. So he rules for about, what, 45 years. And um, Augustus is the most important Roman of all time. Augustus is the most important Roman leader of all time. R whether you talk about the Republic or you talk about uh, the empire, Augustus is the most important person in the whole history of Rome. The collapsing republic, which, uh, which exists from 500 BC down to zero, the collapsing republic is saved or rebuilt or transformed by Augustus, Rome. And when he dies, he leaves behind a new structure, which we now call the, the empire, that lasted another 500 years. So that's pretty good work. You know, if you can go to, go to, go to work and transform a state, and it lasts 500 years, uh, you did good work. So that's Augustus, the most important Roman of all time. And then the other person you see there, Herod the Great, 74 BC to 4 BC, is one of the most important rulers in the history of Israel. Uh, he was a terrible man, a murdering, uh, I was going to say son of a bitch, but I shouldn't say that. So, <laughs> so, so he was, because we're on the air, you know, you have to watch your language. The FCC will come down on us. So uh, he was a terrible man. But, 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 he did transform Israel, and he did provide the political structure into which uh, Jesus was born. What everyone I is amazed by is the fact that these two figures, Augustus and Jesus of Nazareth, would be contemporaries. Because there's no question Augustus is the most important Roman of a thousand-year story. No question. And there's no, que no question that Jesus of Nazareth is the most important person in the whole of the Western civilization story. So that the two men would be at exactly the same time and would overlap is fascinating to everybody who studies history.